I have a privileged position of being Olympic team manager for British fencing. And in that, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Marcus. So we thought today would be uh, just a really good opportunity to give Marcus a chance to give you some insight into his journey um, from young aspiring uh, athlete up to uh, the medal in Budapest and beyond. Um, just a couple of little bits of housekeeping. Um, we are going to have everybody on mute if you're okay on that. Some of you are on camera. If not, we were asking if people would possibly switch off the cameras if if you want to stay on camera, you are welcome to, but it's maybe easier if you aren't. Um, we're recording this piece for uh, for everyone to be able to listen to it again, and uh, that will be uh, that'll be communicated back to you whenever um, it is it has been completed. So um, again, welcome, and just an update on so just to review those of you who uh, who don't know Marcus. Um, Marcus first competed for Great Britain as a 13 year old in the GB cadet team. Um, he then was selected for the junior team uh, while still a cadet. Uh, he made his debut for the GB senior team in 2010 and uh, competed for Team GB at the Rio Olympics. So um, that's a, a good starting point to you know, give you the, the, the journey that Marcus has been on. Um, we just, Rob, we just need Marcus unmuted, please, if we can. Okay, that's Yeah, it. I'm, back. I'm back in now. This Sorry, is good. You've, got, oh, you've got control. Sorry, okay. So, uh, firstly, welcome, Marcus. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. And you, you're doing well? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, uh, as well as can be expected, as I, as I always say when I see you, the good weather is, uh, it seems to work for you. You're looking fresh and healthy. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of training outside in my garden, which has been good. Keeping busy, keeping keeping up to date with my training program, and uh, just trying to obviously make the most of the situation. Good. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do today is we have a number of questions in already. Thank you very much. Really, really good, insightful questions. Um, we will also have a toolbar whereby we can see the questions as they're coming in. Um, so what we will do is we will look at those questions. We'll hold them to the end if we can. Um, the the basis of the discussion will be talking to Marcus about. Um, that journey from cadet to uh, senior competing at the Rio Olympics, his experience at the Olympics, um, how he coped with the uh, world-class program being dismantled, his decision to relocate to New York, uh, his thoughts and uh, memories of winning his medal in uh, Budapest in, 20, uh, in, in summer last year, um, how he's coping with the lockdown and then plans for uh, the future for this year and next year. So. Um, if we start, Marcus, with um, that, that journey, can you give us a, a talk through the key stages of your progression, your development um, from cadet to junior to senior and identify any key points and learnings along the way? Yeah, um, there's been a lot. I've, I've been doing the sport for quite a long time. So there's been a lot of uh, learning points throughout. I think every year, I, I, the way I look at every year is can I beat... Uh, the year before Marcus, that version of me. So 2016, after I'd done the Olympics, so I'm going into 2017, my goal is, can I be better than that, that last year's version of myself? And every year I want to try and improve and trying to get that. And that's been my mindset, I think, since a kid. It's, it started off because my older brother used to do the sport and I used to compete with him a lot um, in, in everything, not just in fencing, but in, in all different sports. And that kind of competition, really set me off from the beginning and then when he finished when he went to university and didn't do the sport anymore it it was a, it allowed me just to keep going and then my target became myself my my competitive side became can I be better than what I was doing before um as a kid all the way up through now I think my parents have been a huge help I think they've really helped me understand that uh it's the team around you that gets you to where you want to be um I obviously drive myself a lot I really push hard but I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have a good team around me. And, and sometimes the people around you, you maybe aren't uh, the best to get you where you need to be and you need to understand uh, how you move that forwards. And sometimes they need to understand how can they help you move forwards. And, and there's been times where my coaches, as a, as a, before I was going into Cadet Internationals, my first coach actually, he, he said, look, I think I've given everything I can for you in this, in, in terms of what I know about the sport, maybe you should look at uh, a different club or working with a different coach and, and having people like that along the way who sometimes know their limits, sometimes want to push you beyond your limits, sometimes think you can do more, sometimes think maybe they can't do enough and, and move you in the right direction. All of those aspects I think really helped me 
but it really helped me understand that it's a team that's driving me forwards. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned, you know, is my team has been my parents from when I was a, when I was really young to now it's a setup with yourself, with my S and C coach, with Dan and, and the physio. I've always tried to create a little unit around me. Um, so I feel like I can really enjoy the journey, but I can really get the most out of it. I can really get people to help me push while I'm trying to push myself as well. Okay, and within that, as I have, have been lucky enough to spend time with you, um, I think that uh, just to explore the importance of the values and that honesty, uh, the, I quite often we would have, just for those listening, and we have regular um, what we call uh, team Mepstead meetings where we, we discuss, so that's with the people, as Marcus has mentioned, Dan as coach, physio, Maria, Mike, s &C, and then myself, sports psych. And, and I think within those, it's how important it is, it, it is, I would say, say how important it is and ask you for feedback and how important it is for the honesty and the authenticity of those conversations. And you've alluded to it there that everyone in the journey needs to be very clear and honest with each other and the feedback and the, and, and the challenges within a safe, uh, a safe, a positive growth environment. Yeah, for sure. It has to be, for me, it's always about a growth mindset. And I think it's important for, for you guys to understand throughout my career, as a, as a kid, it was me and my parents trying to figure out what, what does international fencing look like? How, what is, what is competing at a world championships? What does that even mean? Um, through going onto a world-class program, then not having a world-class program and having to say, okay, I need to strip everything back. I don't have my unit around me anymore. How do I manage this? How do I keep improving to what I've got now? So don't, you don't have to sit there and think, oh, wow, he's got this situation. That's not possible for me because I don't have it. It's something you can keep driving yourself. And, and the questions I'm asking the team, that I'm getting them to ask me, is questions that I asked myself when I was in that maybe middle period between the end of the world class program and, and what I have now, where I had to kind of sit down and say, okay, how do I drive my, my physio side? How do I drive the S&C? How do I make sure that I'm learning everything I can from this coach? How do I be the manager? And then when I have the opportunity to add people in, it's allowing those people in, but also checking that, yeah, these guys are, are sharing the same values. We're on the same page here. We want to make our best better and we keep on pushing that forwards. And just to slightly explore that, what we refer to as the CEO model. So probably outside of fencing, I would look at tennis as an example. If you look when the tennis player, Andy Murray has the various people. Could you just expand a little bit on, on how you have set that up, how, how you see how that works on a day-to-day -day basis and, and actually probably dispel, I think a lot of people think it's maybe a very difficult thing to do, but from what we have seen, it's, it's about communication and uh, identifying the people. Could you talk through a little bit of that, that model that you have created? Yeah, so I, I basically work on an athlete-led team. Um, but this has come through years and years of work and experience and understanding. Um, for sure, as when I first started as a, as a like eight-year-old, nine-year-old doing the sport, it wasn't an athlete-led team. It wasn't me saying, okay, this is what we do. It was me just learning, understanding, trying to take as much knowledge as I could from people. The same when I was on the world-class program, I was, I was kind of moving into an athlete-led team, um, but there was some obstacles in the way and there was still a lot of learning for me to do. It was really until, I would say, until I moved to New York where it kind of became, okay, I have to lead the team because the team is, is myself and Dan to begin with and then adding more people to it. Then I can say, okay, this is where we're going through. And when you talk about the CEO model, it's not as literal and it doesn't have to be a CEO. It could be uh, the person driving their ship or it could be however you see you leading your team, but it's about uh, uh, a collaboration. It's about sharing the knowledge and and trying to use each person's expertise to get you to be the best and where you want to be. And also understanding what values you each have. So when you're going on this journey, it's a journey that everyone enjoys. You know, I want to sit when I get the gold medal in the Olympics, I want to sit there and be really proud of what I've done and really share in those moments, not feel like I've kind of stepped on everyone to get there or people aren't really happy for my success. I want it to be a shared success and I want everyone to be really enjoying what I'm doing, what we're all doing, what we're working towards. And within that, um, my my feedback on that is that the, the model you have set up is, is one of um, accountability and honesty, which makes it much easier then for people to understand. So it's it's just about being clear and understanding what it is that you want to achieve and then everyone buying into that. That's the, the basis premise of it, isn't it? 
yeah, it's about me owning the journey, but it's also uh, me understanding the expertise that people have. So yeah, this is, this is I, I want to get that gold medal, but I know that I can't do that by myself. I know that I need to have people helping me along the way. I know where I can get the expertise from. So I'm owning the journey. There's no excuses there. The excuses end with me, but it's very much like, how do we as a team drive it forwards? How do we push that, push that in to get that gold medal? Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we, uh, if we jump, which I'm going to go backwards and forwards in this journey, if we go jump to uh, Rio 2016, um, how big an ambition was it as a young fencer for you? We, we as a sport, um, we are, we are blessed that we're still part of the Olympic movement and hopefully we retain. So how important was it for you as a, as a young athlete that you, your, your belief and your ambition that you could both get qualify and win the Olympics how, how important was that in that uh, continual refreshment and and kind of uh, you know, drive forward through difficult times, through good times? Yeah, it's, it's so I, when I was younger, I remember I started fencing when I was nine years old. And at about 12 years old, when we started looking at doing internationals, um, I was doing a lot of other sports and I kind of sat down with my mom and dad and I said, oh, I think I need to stop a load of these other after school sports because... Uh, if we're going to start uh, traveling all, we need to save money. We need to do this. And I want to go to the Olympics. And I think this is, this is the, like the sport I can do. I was doing uh, karate. I was swimming. I was doing football, rugby. Um, but I was like, I really enjoy this. I really want to go. I want to go to the Olympics with it. And then I went through a cadet junior season. And I thought I was training hard. Thought I was doing all the right stuff. But actually, it wasn't until I missed the Olympics in London um, and I realized, OK, I need to I really need to up my game because I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to compete at this level. I'm not good enough to make it. And I want to be I really want to be at that level. So then I switched up. Uh, luckily, we had the world class program. So I was able to really like invest in my training, really get on top of it. Um, I was still balancing my university. So I was trying to to play that balancing game, that school and sport balance. But uh, once I graduated in 2014, then I went full time to 2016. We qualified for Rio. And then in Rio, I kind of hit the point where I was like, OK, actually, I think I'm good enough to compete at this level. I think I'm really good. And, and maybe it's I, I didn't have or maybe I don't have enough confidence in my ability and myself. But it was it was only at that point in 2016 when I'd competed, when I'd walked onto the stage and and I fought Akhmatuzin was the first match that I had a Russian fencer. Um, and I, I was matching him hit for hit. And I felt like, yeah, I can do this against this guy. I can really, really compete against the best. And throughout that season, I'd beaten a Japanese fencer who was world champion. I'd beaten Akhmatuzin previously. I'd been up there with some of the top guys. Um, and it was only then that I realized, okay, I can do this. And I think that, that point gave me a lot of confidence to say, okay, now I need to take this journey that other step higher. I need to go that other step more. So like I said, it's always a learning point. You kind of look back and say, okay, I, th I, think, I'm, I think I'm doing really well. I think I'm training really hard, but I can do more. I can always do that a little bit more and just keep pushing it in that sense. What's interesting within that is that there you are uh, perceived as being this confident, 100% ready athlete competing at the Olympics, but there's still a little bit of, of, uh, of need for self-confidence a little bit of doubt so I, I think that for our younger athletes to recognize that actually those you're competing against at the other end of the paste are are not necessarily in a better mental state of confidence than you are that I, I, on this journey there's always there's always more confidence that can be gained more to be learned and i think what you're highlighting there is that from from I, I, from achieving that qualification in the olympics to competing you realize there's even another step up beyond that yeah, and I think it's important to understand the confidence is grounded in my actions. It's grounded in my training. It's not, a, it's not something, it's not an it that I can just be more confident or, uh, yeah, it doesn't work like that. It, it, my, or my understanding of it, it works from grounding it through my training, building, my, like building up the actions, really working on my site, working on my gym training, working on my technical stuff so that I can be more confident in those kind of actions. And that allows me to perform when it comes to the competitions, when it comes to world championships. It, all that build-up allowed me to do that. But for sure, the, the first Olympic Games I did, I, I'd done uh, university games, I'd competed at world championships. But the, I guess that there wasn't a lot of 
a lot of um, people that I knew who had who had done that, who had gone through that journey and really shared what they what they'd done. So for me, when you go into that first experience, it's suddenly like, oh wow, this is this is something. This is something I need to get ready for. And and that first Olympic Games in Rio was, I guess, that moment for me. And then hopefully the next one in Tokyo is going to be going for the medal because I've had that experience. I I don't need it again. I've had that first part. Now I want the medal. Okay, wonderful. I think that that gives really good insight into that. There's there's a there's a continual journey. Continue continue to be curious. Continue to try and evolve as as you move forward. Um, following the Rio Olympics, the, the world class program. And just for those of you who may be not familiar with the world class program, it's when uh, fence, fencing was funded so that we had athletes who run a full time program to just be fencers. Um, so that comes from the UK sport. Um, so that that ran in the period from London through uh, through Rio. Um, unfortunately, uh, the uh, funding was withdrawn following Rio, and uh, the athletes were given short notice. At which point, they, they were no longer funded athletes. So, uh, I just to to kind of explore that that would be a major cultural and logistical shock for those who are in the system, and uh, it, it's a highlight of. Uh, actually, that the, the international sport is a, is a ruthless environment. So we need to this resilience. We we have continued. We talk about in, in a number of in, in number of um, in parts of, of fencing development. How did uh, how how did that impact on you? What were your initial emotions and initial thoughts? And then probably as important, how did you cope with that? Losing that support around you and losing the funding. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was, a, it was difficult to know that the funding had, it was difficult to know what to do because there were so many uncertainties. And I think when you're trying to look ahead or when you're trying to build a four year program, and then there's just so many questions like, how do I fund this? How am I going to train? Who, how do I, who am I going to work with? How am I going to wait to make this work? Should I still be doing this? Uh, is this, am I good enough? Uh, given now this situation, because we've got to compete against the same guys who have this international setup, all those questions coming through. So that definitely, definitely hits you uh, for six. And we, I say we, James Davis and I, we, we sat down and kind of went through all these ways. It's like, okay, how are we going to finance this? How are we going to set our training up? How do we create a, a world-class program for ourselves on a bare bones project? Um, and we looked at all these different ways to do, and there were so many, things which you looked at and was like this is just not possible so there was definitely parts which really kind of made me think oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to continue if I'm going to be able to make this work but there were also other parts which I was like okay I have a new opportunity here there was definitely parts of the world class program which I thought were really good and there were some which really challenged my values and I didn't really think was that good at all and and it was quite a struggle so I was able to tap into those parts and say okay what wasn't I happy about how can I make that change and the other side is, okay, what do I need here to really keep going? And obviously the financial aspect was a really big thing. And uh, we found out December uh, 2016, yeah, December 2016, what, uh, that we weren't going to have any more funding. And I set myself the target of July 2017 um, to basically find the money that I needed to or find a way to make the money that would support me for the next four years. And if I didn't have a clear budget, a clear outlook that I was going to do that, then I was going to retire and, and not do the sport anymore because it just, it was difficult. Uh, it looked too difficult to make it, to make it count. And as I said, I wanted to go to another Olympic games, not just to compete, not just to get the t-shirt, but to, to make a medal, to actually be at the top level. Um, so I wrote to a lot of people. I was so many meetings with different people. Some just giving me advice, some offering ways to get sponsorship. Others were actually giving sponsorship, but I was working through that whole process. And then with that as well, we were coming up to the end of the world-class program. So uh, my funding finished in April, 2017. And uh, that covered me for Paris and Anna, uh, LA, their competition in LA. So I made a point over those competitions. I knew that that was going to be covered by the by the funding to go and meet coaches. So I met the the French coach, uh, a, a coach from a French club. Uh, when I was in Anaheim, I went to New York to meet up with Dan Kellner. I uh, spoke to Sheng Lei, who was a 2012 Olympian from China, and made a deal with him that I would train with him in in his club in Beijing before the Shanghai Grand Prix. Um, 
uh, in return for doing some work out there and getting some training and meeting the coaches that were out there. So I had in my mind, I said, like, okay, I need to find a new coach. And I was setting up ways to do that. I need to find money and I was setting up ways to do that. And then I was just writing up all the stuff that I'd learned from the, the world-class program. I, I, I have a big database of all the physio stuff, all the, all the performance analysis, all the S and C training I'd done, all the nutrition, all these things. I, I was always making a note throughout the two or three years. So I was looking at that and said, okay, I can build this stuff myself. It's not going to be the best. It's not going to be the top level, but it's going to keep me through. The same with my sports side. Uh, all the work that I'd done from 2013 to 2016, I had it all on my computer. So I was like, okay, I have a training plan in place. I need to find my coach. And luckily I was able to connect with Dan Kellner and, and what I, who I thought was a good coach for me has obviously turned out to be a really good coach for me and, and a situation that really worked. Um, and yeah, luckily by July, I was able to hit my funding target and see a way that I could work while being abroad um, through online personal training. And I set that all up. And then, then it was just the beginning. Then it was like, okay, I moved out to New York in August. And I was like, right, you've got to keep working with this. this you've done the first step, but now we've got to keep working through. And those little points, you know, it was the same. We qualified for Rio in, in April. And it's not, that's it. You don't qualify. Okay, you have a little bit of celebrate. But you know, I've now got to go and, and work towards the Olympics. I've got to go keep doing what I'm doing. I've got to keep improving. Um, so it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. It's like, I hit my target where I needed to be. But that's just the start. Now I need to keep working and working. And that sounds like that was the the, 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 the start of the what we 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 in this, for this conversation called the CEO model. We could we could rename it something else, but it feels like that was the start of the understanding of developing that team with you as the driving force behind it. But then engaging and bringing on people who you help who you wanted to be on the journey with you. Yeah, exactly. And and just again, so you guys can understand, I'm the CEO of this model. But I went to Dan. I went to my coach with the understanding that I know nothing about the sport. I had to go, I, I'm, a, I'm a fresh, like clean slate. I need to really understand everything that he's trying to teach me, take all this knowledge of his understanding of fencing, his model that he wanted to put through. Every time he corrected me, I had to say, okay, it doesn't matter that you just went to an Olympics. It doesn't matter how good you were in the UK. Come to this guy with the understanding that I, I've got an empty bowl and I need to fill it up. And it took me, I would say a year and a half before I then felt, okay, I can now add my own, my own stuff to this. I feel like I understand what he's teaching me. I really, really understand it. And I can add now like Marcus, of Mep Marcus Mepstead's version of what Dan Kellner is teaching. Um, I can make it adaptable. I can, I can make it my own. Um, but for the first year and a half, it was, it was hard because there was, there was guys that I was beating. Um, so Sam Mollis had, had come to train one time with us and I was, I was pretty comfortable beating him. And then I moved to New York trying to learn Dan's way of uh, fencing. And then I was like, I can't beat this guy anymore. I'm, I'm not even just can't beat him. I'm getting my, I'm getting beaten really badly. And, and there were times where I'd be like walking back to my flat in New York and just like, is this the right decision? Should I be doing this? Like all these questions going on in your head, but you just keep saying, oh, no, you've got to keep trying, got to keep trying. And, and it, yeah, for me, it was like, if I can beat this guy, who's been training with Dan for so many years, doing this, doing the stuff that he knows best. I was like, then I'm moving in the right track. And a 15-4 and a loss became a 15-6 loss, became 15-10. And then those moments when it was like 15-13, 15-14, and I wanted to say, okay, let's just use your old stuff. Let's beat him with this stuff. Get that win because I haven't beaten him for so long. It was like, no, beat him with the stuff that Dan's teaching you. If you can do that, then you can do it in competition and you can really work through. And it was that mindset, again, that growth mindset, me understanding that, yeah, I'm, I'm leading my journey, but in this situation, I've got to just take up everything I can. And, and that, I feel, has really helped me a lot. And it sounds like, and as I know you, that commitment, that you, 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 the total commitment, so you go through the, the process, you ask the questions, you look at the team, but all through that difficult journey from the world-class program being dismantled. You took a lot of the good stuff from the world-class program, but, but all through this, there was the, the commitment and the drive that, that Tokyo, the medal in Tokyo, was what you were working towards. Yeah, for sure. And, and it, was, it was interesting because I spent, I spent a lot of time working with my sports site running up to Rio about really engaging in the journey. It's not about the outcome, it's about the journey and really understanding what that means. Not just saying, yeah, or paying lip service to it, but actually really understanding what that meant. And I had a moment in Rio 
where I walked out and I could see my friends and family. And then, and it might sound weird, but I've never, I hadn't before then seen like someone proud, like really proud, look at me. And so I saw them like so proud and I was like, oh wow, that's a really, that's a really nice feeling, like a really nice moment to have. And that was one, that was, I would say like probably one of the biggest moments from the Rio Olympics, like seeing that, feeling that moment with them. And it, it just almost had a flashback to like my first competition, uh, going to Germany with my mum and dad, like having that experience. And then like fast forwarding all the way back to this moment. And that was like, okay, I had that moment. That's really good. And if I go, if I go to Tokyo, I want that moment again, but I want more. I don't want to just keep repeating that. So that's, that's why that definitely grounded me. But I also had this vision. I was like, okay, I need to be at this level to be better, to get that, to be at the top. And, and for some people, it might have seemed a bit crazy. I know the performance director at the end, she, she probably, I think if I told her, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to go to Tokyo. I'm, I've got to be top 16 in the world. I've got to be better than Richard Cruz, who's at one point was number one in the world. But if we don't qualify a team, I need to be there. And if we're going to qualify a team, this is where we need to be. I think a lot of people would just said, no, that, that doesn't make sense. That's crazy. You can't do it. But you have to believe in yourself and say, you know what? Actually, I can do this. I can keep driving forwards. I'm going to surround myself with people that are on board with you on that journey. But also I have to really look at myself. And, and so I have this weird analogy that I have this little, like uh, the fire inside of you. And sometimes it's like really close to burning out, but it's still always like a little ember. And other times it's really like a strong flame. And I feel like that it varies throughout, throughout your season and throughout your career. Some days you're really beat up. Some days you're on top of the world. But you just got to keep like stoking the, the fire, keep it burning, keep it going so you can keep pushing through. I think that connects very nicely with the Olympic flame that is just constantly burning yeah. somewhere. That around the Olympics, it's big and it's massive and it can be seen around the world. But other times, it's just nicely taking along in, in non-Olympic years. Um, and so just that, that journey, that decision, August 2017, you moved to New York. You've talked about Dan, how, uh, how important Dan uh, Kellner, who is a, is a fantastic human being, um, was in that. What, what were the key factors be that behind that decision? And also what were the, I think you've alluded to some of the logistical issues. How did you actually survive financially during that period? And, and, and what was it? What, so a, a, almost like if you could give us a quick, what was a day like as a world-class program athlete? What was a day like as Marcus Mepstead trying to, 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 to build Team Mepstead? What, and what, what were the decisions that led you firstly to Dan? So the decisions that led me to Dan were understanding that four years seems a long time, but actually it's, it's not, that, not that much at all. For you to change your style to, or develop, evolve your style, to move from a top 40 in the world, top 30, 40 in the world ranked athlete to a top 16 in the world. Um, I looked at coaches who I felt produced athletes that were similar-ish to my style. So like James Davis, to, he's in, in the Marcialis, uh, with the Marcialis Center. Their style of fencing is very different and it's really, really effective, really good. But I looked at it and said, am I going to be able to replicate that in two or three years? Is that going to suit my style? Is that going to suit my body shape? Is that going to suit the way that I think about the sport? Um, and that, that was one factor. The other factor was also how do I fit in with this club? If I'm going to when I moved to China, for example, if, if they, I know that they close up sometimes uh, in the run up to the Olympics, they stop allowing international athletes in. So how would that work with me? I just spent two years being there and then the, the three, four months running up to Tokyo, would I be, out, uh, be able to train there? Um, that was another factor. Also was how do I fit into the system? So would I be one of the top athletes, seen as one of the top athletes that he would want to work with? Or would I be number two, number three? Um, or would I just be making up the numbers? And those were the things I wanted to look at. And then also how the, the coach saw fencing. Did it fit with what I, what I imagined it to be? I wanted it to, uh, I really wanted that to sink because I've been with some coaches that I felt just had a very different idea of fencing to me. And then you'd have those moments, those 14, 14 moments or those moments in training where you're, I feel like you're almost breaking the, the boundary on the, the next level. You're, you're going up from the plateau and you just feel like oh, I'm not getting there. I don't understand why we're going through this, these actions or what we're doing. So when I spoke to him uh, about all this stuff and I was pretty open with him, I said, look, 
haven't got much money to, to, to work with. I know New York is going to be really expensive. Can we figure out like how that's going to work? Can you just tell me about what you think about fencing, what you understand, what you did with race, who was, is, uh, was, uh, I think world number one when he worked with Dan, like what you did with Sam, who was a cadet world champion, what you do with the other athletes coming through. And I just wanted to get a feel of him as a coach on a performance level, but also as a coach in terms of developing a, a person. Um, and I did that with the other coaches. And the reasons why I chose Dan over those other coaches were, I think the sink was best. Was best. The other coaches were really good. Um, I, I don't, I didn't dismiss them because of any technical or personal ability. But I, I, for me, I felt like I connected best with Dan. And the other, the biggest hurdle for me was a financial aspect. How am I going to make it work in New York? How would that be possible? So I'm going somewhere like Beijing was obviously going to be a lot, a lot cheaper and a lot more manageable. Um, but that was offset by maybe the quality of life um, in terms of the food that I could get or the, some of the pollution, stuff like that. So when I factored all those things in together, um, the biggest struggle was, was how am I going to make it work financially? Because I found this coach that I thought really was in sync with me, but actually financially was going to be really difficult. And that was, that was almost, I would say, the opposite with the world-class program is we had the financial, we were supported financially really well. But the coaching side that I was looking for wasn't quite the same. And I think I had a, I think the, the coach running the program was really good, but maybe it, we didn't sync so well together as I do with Dan. Um, and that was, that was, I think quite a big difference between me being a, like I said, a top 30 in the world athlete and top 16 world championship medalist. Um, and then trying to make it work in New York was really hard. Like the first year, when you're rack, racking up debts because I had some funding but then I moved out there and I was like oh, I don't think I've got enough to live here this isn't quite working as, as well as I thought it would be I was working at the club but then trying to make sure that I was still getting my recovery time still putting in the work still being able to compete at the top level so it was just balancing that through and and my the mental work that I need or the sports site work that I needed to do was a lot more balancing with with the outside pressures rather than just balancing from a sporting point of view. It was using all the stuff that I'd understood, but applying it to my personal rather than just my, me as an athlete. And I worked through, uh, set up like a personal training business that started off with a lot of clients, but are paying really low. Um, so slowly working that price range up. So I was able to move up, drop the number of clients down, but maybe pay, uh, charge a little bit more once I'd really start to get a bond with them. And it took, again, like two years, two, three years. I, was, I won my world championship medal, had a day off before the team. And in that, uh, that day off, I was doing all my recovery stuff and doing personal training sessions with clients back in New York before then getting ready for the team event. And that was a lot of what was happening during the season. Um, I would go to, to training camps and in those training camps doing doing personal training sessions afterwards, having World Cups, and at the end on a Sunday evening, we'd be trying to fit in a, a training session with someone. So it was that balancing act and trying to really understand how do I make this work? And, and the whole goal was in that qualifying period from 2019 to 2020 was to give myself the setup so that everything went from a bare bones project to more. I was able to not have as much debt, so I was able to add more to my team. I was able to put more effort into the training. So I wanted to have, if you look at like, the graph one was my focus on fencing was getting higher and everything that I was doing to get myself up there was getting more and more as the, as the months went on. And then the outside stuff was going down as that was getting closer to the Olympics as well. And, and I felt like, okay, got two, two and a half years to make that work. I felt like I had enough time to do it. Honestly, probably it would, a, a whole complete four year cycle might've been, might've been a little bit less stressful, but, uh, Sometimes you're in those moments of stress, stress, you get creative and you really make things happen, which you didn't think could, could be possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the, uh, I just wanted to explore again, I'm privileged to, to have spent a lot of time with yourself and Dan. And I, I, I really applaud the relationship you have whereby there's a, there's a real genuine friendship there, but there's a really nice check and balance and challenge uh, you have between you. So a lot of what we're talking to our young fencers in British fencing and to the coaches is about a reciprocal um, responsibility. So it's not about the coach telling the athlete what to do 
or it's not about the athlete just asking the coach what to do. Uh, and so just in terms of that, can you give us a little insight into the sorts of, so the conversations you have with Dan, both in the lead up to competition around training, how you, how you structure that if you need, if you want to uh, kind of address something you need to change or he, he his advice right through to, you know, how you uh, reflect on competitions, how you do your video analysis, just a little insight because I think that the way you guys operate is, is, a, is a really wonderful model. Yeah, so I think it's important for me to obviously respect the coach. I will listen to everything he says and I will always ask questions coming from curiosity i want to learn that's my mindset from it rather than insecurity and just to explain that a question coming from insecurity is more of a challenge it's more of a i don't believe what you're saying i'm right you're wrong kind of situation whereas when it comes from curiosity when it comes from an actual question point of view it's saying i don't understand can you explain to me more please uh i want to understand this i want us to get better this is about us um so i think we both do that really well we both come to to, to the conversations with that understanding and the other stuff that we do um, is just keep building on our keep, keep having conversations about how we're feeling in the in the competitions how we're feeling in training what we're doing being up at me accepting sometimes when I'm when I've maybe been out of place when I'm not been in the in the in the right frame of mind and and addressing that very quickly um, so for example in Tokyo there was a moment when I was fencing Safin and I wanted to call video and I, and I looked at Dan and, and Dan said, don't call video, it's not yours. And I, I just like blurted out. I was like, ah, oh, why, why aren't you backing me? Like, come on, back me, man. And as soon as I said it, I was like, why did you say that? That's really, obviously this guy backs you. Obviously you're on the same team. Like, so those moments are always going to be there. And as soon as it was nice, because in training, whenever we have those moments, I address it straight away. He addresses it as well. And that allows us in me in competition to have that almost like in uh internal addressing i say no that obviously he's on your team and then i was like yeah i don't need to go for a video i trust you and it's those moments where we can be have open conversation um that it keeps it keeps us the communication keep building and allows us to to perform the way we want to and it's still it's still growing it's still evolving we're still learning more uh we had a, a session the other day and we both come up it was quite funny we both were very very polite in the way that we were speaking to each other sometimes and there were moments where we just needed to get to the point and not like beat around the bush and he said oh i i do this because i don't want to lose a really good athlete and i said oh i do this because i i don't want to lose a really good coach and we both had this really good thing <laughs> which we were holding on to so much but like didn't want to upset the other one and as soon as we have that conversation that that elephant in the room, in the room goes and you can say oh, okay i can get better we can get better now because we know that we're both on each other's team, even though you think about it, it's like, yeah, that's so obvious. Like sometimes you're in those pressure scenarios, the obvious stuff just goes out the window. So it's all about communication, I feel like, having that communication, saying when you need help, saying when you're, you, I feel like I'm on the right track, are you on the same page as me? Or saying, I don't understand, and just, can you explain this technical move? Or can you explain this? Or why did the referee give me that action? And why didn't he give me that? Um, and yeah, just keep building on so you both know you're on the same page and on the same team. And those relationships uh, are the same through the rest of your team, Maria, Physio, you can have those conversations with. Um, and, and certainly I think the group that we operate in, that's what's really nice, that there's no, no one takes anything personally. Everyone is, is prepared because they understand they're all on the same journey. So everyone in your team signs up to those values and those sorts of conversations. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's not like, a, a, oh, I'm going to say to you, um, this is coming from a good place and then start to be really rude or start to be quite reckless or aggressive with the conversation we're having. No, it, generally I check with myself, is this question coming from a good place? If it isn't, why not? And then I need to address that myself sometimes or then I have a separate conversation with the person say can you just explain to me I'm having a little bit of a misunderstanding here or I don't get this and just coming at it from that place makes it a lot better makes me then really be able to all the time be that empty bowl come to the physio and say oh, I'm having a little bit of problem with my shoulder or my forearm or my leg or wherever and say can you help me please and actually take it in and listen and us work together with the same with you I say oh I need help with this I need I, I, can you help me understand this better or I have this question do you know who I can ask and you're able just to help straight away because we've had that open communication and I think that's the problem a lot of the time people 
assume that the other person should automatically understand them. But if they haven't explained it well enough or they haven't said it, where they haven't really communicated what they want, it's very hard for the opposite person to understand. And I think that's what we do as a team. The, the, the five of us are doing really well is, is stepping out of ourselves and saying, no, maybe Johnny doesn't understand where I'm coming from. You need, I need to explain it better instead of it being like, oh, Johnny doesn't understand. Why doesn't he understand? What's wrong here? Um, so yeah, it's, it's internalizing that process and being able to take perspective so you can ask the right questions and keep growing. And I think what we are learning is that particularly when you get to the competition environment where emotions are high and, and everyone is stretched logistically, that if you have that basis of those relationships, you can have those hard conversations in real time in competition. And I think that was something that worked really well in, in the journey in Budapest, that there were lots of decisions to be made at the time and there were just very open, honest conversations and that we didn't miss anything. Yeah, completely. And there's always going to be new situations with throw up. Um, I guess if some of you guys think in there, well, if you're so good at this, why don't you keep winning medals? Why don't you keep doing this? And, and it's because these situations keep evolving. I'm still having to learn. I'm still having to get better. I'm still having to improve. And sometimes it will be the same situation, but masked in a different way. And then after you've had that and, and done well in the situation or haven't, you'll look back and be like, oh man, that was, that was the same thing that I did in the last competition, but it's just turned up in a different way. And I just need to address that. I need to improve on that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a complete learning curve always. So if I'm sounding like I, I'm a master at this, I know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm moving in that direction, but I don't, I'm not in complete control. I still need to keep learning. I still need to keep improving and growing on it. Okay. Um, if we, uh, if we jump back to almost a year ago, Budapest last year, um, fantastic memories of winning a silver medal at the world championship, still, uh, one of the, one of the highlights of, of, of my life, both in fencing and outside, were a great day, great couple of days. Um, what are your overriding memories of the championships, I suppose the emotions of that, and how that aligns with what you had hoped um, the success would be like as, as, a, as a young fencer coming through? And, and, so, and, and then also prior to that, what were the key milestones that um, were, the, were, the, were the pillars for, the, for building towards that medal? Yeah, so I think the key build up to it, it's, always, it's a funny question when people say like, oh, what, what was it that was different or what happened? And I feel like as an athlete, you're just building through that journey from a kid. You just keep building up, building up and, and you keep working towards those moments and just give yourself the, sorry, the best opportunity to be ready for that when they come. There was definitely, you know, I can say the move to New York was definitely a key moment because I started working with a coach like Dan, which I think has taken my game to the next level. The, the dismantling of the world-class program was a key moment because that actually allowed me to move, gave me the option to say, okay, I have to move somewhere else. I have to, have to really make this and own this journey. So all those things add up. Um, the, the continuous training, everything, all the work that I've been doing on the sports psych side, all the fitness training that I've been doing allows me to be in the position. So when the moment comes, I'm ready to perform. I think that that is when it comes to key build up, all of that builds up through, all of that works through. Uh, in the actual day, it's, it was such a roller coaster of a competition because the beginning was just terrible. Like I'd had my first senior world championships in, in Budapest and it was, I, I, I just, I guess, flopped completely. I, I wanted to do so well. I put so much pressure on myself to do well. And I turned up in the competition and I end up just doing really, like not really badly, but just really underperforming and, and really just not doing how I wanted to be. Um, and I think that was a little bit playing in my mind when I went to Budapest again for this competition. There's also been other stuff that, funny enough, Budapest doesn't seem to be the best city for me. Like I had, a, I was on holiday with some friends one time and ended up having acid sprayed in my face. And all these, these moments like, kind of built up at the beginning when I was there and I arrived in Budapest and I was like working through them doing my 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 checks like mentally just to make sure that they weren't that I was addressing them that I was validating them but they weren't like becoming all-encompassing but I started competing in the pools and it, and it was I just felt like very like rabbit in the headlights like not able to do anything um and it was just it was a sh like a shake up from from the guys around me it was like just 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 get through get through your pool matches take it one at a time just keep working through and i made it through the, the pools just scraped through had my first two matches um i guess fortunately the the two guys that i had were 
maybe not the not the the strongest the strongest guys um it was definitely people that on a bad day I, I was able to beat and it was a bad day and I was able to beat them so that was really good but it was really you know that that day was all about like beating myself I'm sure everyone has had that moment where they're fighting and they just have got that little demon inside or that the 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 inner person who's just you have to overcome in that moment and I, and that day was all about overcoming that 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 person that me basically beating myself and once I did that I was then able to just enjoy the competition it wasn't even a competition just enjoy enjoy it now I, I was no longer so focused on the competition no longer this is an Olympic qualifier this is so important it was like man I get to just enjoy doing what I really love I really I really enjoy the sport like why am I making it so such a big thing why am I bringing back random occasions in Budapest and making it relevant to now and it's just not relevant at all and I think that set me up really well to then again ev everyone talks about oh you had world number one and and I didn't see it like that I just said oh I get to fence I get to really do what I enjoy like let's let's make the most of this and let's let's keep going and I just kept on going just kept on fighting and fighting and really like just enjoying each moment I got to fight out there each moment I was spending hearing people in the crowd like sharing uh shouting my name getting to catch up with you after each match same with dan same with the physio same with my parents just kept on like chucking through this uh yeah going through this journey on the day but just enjoying it the whole time and there were moments obviously as i got closer to the final i i think the the semi-final match was the first time that i felt i i was brought back into a competition um that was when I, I said to myself, I was like, imagine this is like the Olympics. You want to you wanna be fighting for gold and silver. You don't want to be fighting for bronze and no medal. So beat this guy. You've got to beat this guy. No matter what happens, you've got to beat this guy. And that was the first moment it became a, you've got to win. You've got you to gotta compete. And it worked because I was able to push through. And I'd, I'd never beaten that uh, son. I'd never beaten the Korean before. It was always, if the closest I'd been was five, four losses or or two or three touches down in a DE, but I'd never actually beaten him. So for me to go there and really push through and, and just keep working. And again, there were little moments, checkpoints in the match where I felt at the beginning, I was I, well, not beginning in the middle of the match, I saw he was getting tired and I was just like, man, I'm, this Koreans never get tired and I'm making this guy tired and I'm so tired, but I'm able to do this. And then having to check yourself back in and be back in the present. So there are all these moments, all these like tools that I work with mentally, there are moments when you're aware and you come out of the present, but then you, you're able to guide yourself back in. You have this thought pop in your head and you kind of just let it pass. And there are moments I do that really well and moments I don't. And throughout that whole day, I think I was just able to be very present and enjoy what I was doing more than focus on being in a competition, which I know sounds very weird because I was in a competition and you're competing to beat these people. But sometimes it's that just the element of understanding where you are and being present in it allows you to really perform how you want to be. My memory of, of the, the day in terms of the reasonably frenetic as we went through the day and as the, as the stakes essentially you know, racked up closer to the final was that we, we in real time got a process going which was based on a lot of your processes and I think that that, that was the first realisation of how that, that team unit was starting to function and, and I think that, that at that point it felt like that was the evolution of you being very much in control and also looking back on what you had done to get to that point and it looked like in your confidence that you were always able to reference either consciously or subconsciously to all the work that you had done in both psych and physical in preparation to that point did, did that feel like that for you yeah definitely and and there were moments like in the in the pool um when i was struggling dan came up to me and he was like you've worked too hard um maybe not as polite as that but he, he was like you've worked too hard to, to get to this point you've done so much like you've, you've been like working really hard in New York don't give this up don't don't waste that don't just let that opportunity go by you know and, and I, we don't I didn't realize or Dan and I didn't realize that moment was tapping into tapping into the, the values or, or or something inside of me that was allowing me to say okay I can go out before I can go and beat this person I can go and work through um but it was yeah it was all that stuff all the work that I had done years and years and years was coming up to this place and and yeah, I, I think that was it. It's, it was just an accumulation of everything, which allowed me to say, okay, I know how I want my team to be. I know how I want to keep, keep pushing. But it's also still understanding more and more, how do I keep making that better? 
And on the on that journey to to the medal from the the young cadet, if you were to pull out the characteristics that you've identified and then developed and focused on within yourself, and for for you know the, those people listening in today, what would be the ones? And it it obviously can be different for individual people. What would be if you have your toolkit of the the stuff that you know makes Marcus? the person and the athlete he is, what, what are the bits that you have really nurtured and grown and, and challenged within yourself? Um, I think I've challenged a lot how I address problems and I, I, I'm still trying to address that better and better. I, I think sometimes I can be way too over analytical, way too into the detail of it. Uh, you know, the saying like, can't see the wood through the trees, that kind of thing. I'm still trying to work through that quite a lot. I think I've done a good job and I always try and do this of surrounding myself with a good team. I think that's really important to have. Um, I think probably which is going to be most useful for, for like the younger guys and girls watching is to understand what your strengths are and really try and make it like that the best in the world. Um, and your strength doesn't have to be the same as mine or the same as, as any of the other guy, any of the top guys. It, it has to be what's, what you feel like you can do better than anyone else. So when I was growing up, obviously Richard was, was uh, the number one guy and he was just taller than me. He was able to hit the stop hits really well. And I looked at that and said, there's, there's no way that's going to be my game. There's no point in making that, that my game. And I was, I'm lucky that I guess my, partly my genetics, I've got really strong legs. I was able to work really hard in the gym and say, okay, I'm going to make my footwork the best in the world. I'm going to make it really, really good. And what does that, how do I break that down and make that happen? The other thing I looked at and said, I'm going to be the hardest worker. I want to be seen as one of the hardest working people. And it sounds weird as well, because from a young age, you look at these guys sometimes that maybe that, that everyone talks about talent or they talk about this gift that people have. And you just kind of say like, oh, how are they able to do this without doing any work? You know, the whole uh, Usain Bolt was able to eat chicken nuggets and not train very hard. Like that guy, he obviously trains really hard. And and this is one thing I wanted to set my mind at and said, you know what? It's not a problem to train really hard. It's not a problem to be the hardest worker in the room, the person that gets there first and leaves last. Make that one of your world's best skills. Make that something you can really do. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say, I wanted to look at was like the, the, the way I analyze stuff. I know I have this like analytical mindset that, that can get lost in the detail sometimes. It can be an overplayed strength. But I was like, I, I feel like I really understand when I'm fighting people, what they're going to do, the way they're setting up their game plan, the way that the coaches on the other side is feeding it in. Um, as a, I only had my dad a lot of the time to go through, through competitions and he slowly understood the sport a little bit more, but he's, most of the time he's still just cheering when my light comes on. So it was like just trying to understand what, that, what it is that I need to do to build up a game plan. And I would say those three things, I really was like, okay, make that, make that my game and then from there I looked at what does the top athletes footwork look like how how do you make that work what do the athletes are maybe the same height as you playing the same kind of game what does that look like and then when I went to my gym coach for example I said look these these are the top guys right now this is uh, their style of fencing this is my style of fencing and I want to kind of work towards that I want to improve my footwork I want to build this I want to do that and the same with my sports psychologist I said look I think I'm really good at analyzing stuff but how can I be better? How can I work through that? And all of that was governed by my understanding of what my strengths are and how I make them better, how I make them super strengths and how I make them the world's best. Okay, wonderful. Um, if we go back a, a short while to the end of March, um, we were all in California for at Anaheim for the last Grand Prix, which was to be the, the final qualification um, competition for uh, the Olympics and at, at that time and, and you still are your number one ranked European for the automatic uh, qualifying spot and ranked number 14 in the world we, we found out very late um, we had done a lot of work we were already preparing everything through to the dates that kit could be collected for the Olympics and, and we you know there's a lot of forward planning going on when we found out very late notice how, how did you how did that impact on you um, because uh, we, we all believe you were ready just to close out the qualification. How did that impact you and how did you deal with that disappointment? I, I, yeah, I think I found it quite difficult. Um, like I said, I, I work through a lot of, uh, I spend a lot of time on my sports psychology. So trying to 
get ready for all these different scenarios. And, and one of the things I worked at a lot after, after winning the medal was actually being okay not qualifying. What, uh, that freedom of accepting that not qualifying might be an option was going to allow, we felt was going to allow me to really perform to the best of my ability, really just to keep pushing through and not make it about, you've just won this medal. How can you not qualify? Or how are you not going to qualify? Be like, you've just won this medal. Let's keep evolving. Let's keep growing. Um, it's taken from a, from a samurai mindset, actually, where they are accepting before they go into battle, they're going to die. And that no longer having that fear of death allows them to fight and just fight with complete freedom. And, and that was the kind of idea that we had from it. But with that in mind, that allowed me to kind of sit in that position and say, OK, well, I've done all this work to accept that this might not happening maybe it's not going to happen this situation is not happening right now i was able to manage how i was feeling in that sense okay but i definitely felt very disappointed i was struggling for motivation at the beginning of the lockdown um and i think that was in part because i went through self-isolation um for two weeks where i was just like the four walls around me i was in new york for a little bit uh, at the beginning there was so much uncertainty we didn't know what was going to happen we didn't know if the olympics were still going to go on we didn't know what anything was looking like and it was suddenly going from a I've just spent the last like three years really trying to build up to this moment to saying okay now I've just got to take it step by step and really understand so the beginning the first for sure the first four or five weeks was was very hard to find motivation very hard for me to to really know what to what to do and and how to not not to have my brain in overdrive and and not to spiral down into disappointment but to say, okay, we've got this team around us. Let's check in with each other. Let's make sure that we are supporting each other. Um, let's check in with myself. I need to validate how I'm feeling. When I'm not feeling good, either speak to people if you need to or, or like work through the stuff that you've done to be able to manage it yourself. Um, and then make a log logical plan that allows me to go step by step. That doesn't look at... Uh, a year or a year and a half ahead, but actually does just look at the next week or next two weeks ahead. And it was just reframing that mindset, reframing the perspective so I could do that. Um, and yeah, it took me six weeks to say, okay, I feel like I'm in a good, uh, in, a, in a better place to, to really start training again, whatever that new version of training looks like. Um, yeah, because to go, it was the, one of the hardest things, like when I talk about the new training was to go from, doing these like really intense lessons where we've just built up all this stuff. It's like a accumulation, always evolving, evolving to suddenly saying, okay, now you're just going to hit a tennis ball on a string and hit it twice on the, there and on the, when it comes back, you're going to do some footwork. And I was like, where did this suddenly go? What, how, how do I reset myself? Like, is this, is this like the right level? Is this what we need to do? But understanding is like, yeah, that's, we're making the best out of this situation. We are still being creative what we can do. And it's switching that mindset from, from me thinking, okay, it's a growth mindset, but this is still growing. This is still developing. This is still learning in this situation. Um, rather than feeling like, oh, this is a step back, which, which was hard for me to process. But was, once I was able to process, I was able just to jump into the, my, new, my new normal for training like very quickly. And how, just give us a, a, a short insight into your new normal. How is it at the minute in terms of the, what sort of training load you're going through? Yeah, so the new normal for me is like mixing, I guess, the virtual and the, and the physical side. So I take my lessons with Dan. Um, those are through a video call. Uh, it's pretty much footwork-based lessons. He'll, he will uh, work through that. And again, we, we looked at stuff that I was not doing well um, in, over the Olympic cycle and addressing that really working through this the same with the physio where we've gone through a program that is addressing any of the minor injuries that i was having anything that can make me stronger more robust and from the snc point of view i was able to collect a load of gym equipment so i've, I've got a little space in my garden where i'm able just to train um albeit weather weather allowing but i just i, I do my training there and then there was a switch to the uh, a heavier switch to the sports site side. We thought this was a really good opportunity for Dan and I to, to really improve our communication, to work through what that looks like. Um, so that's definitely increased. And I started working with, a, I guess, a new sponsor that works on decision making. Um, they have a program it's called iGym program, but they work on 
I guess, reactions and decision making. So while I haven't got any sparring or haven't got any competitions on, I'm able to still train not as much, but it's, it's to a level on this computer program that allows me to, to keep my reactions in, in, in check. Um, and then, yeah, just, I guess, working, working through all those things, keeping in touch with the team, keeping in touch with you and the other guys, making sure that we have those, those meetings in place so that we all feel one as a team, we're doing okay. Individually, we're doing okay, but we're also checking in to see when we can go step by step to week by week to month by month to, okay, we've got a year plan in place or a six month plan in place to, to be ready for, for Tokyo 2021. And in terms of whilst we don't have plans, it's an evolving situation waiting for the FIA to tell us when we start again. Um, how do you, how do you set your goals for the remainder of this year and next year within, within what you, your daily routine, how is that tailored to that? Yeah. So, so now it's a, it's an assumption that maybe we'll start back in January, uh, December, November, December, January time, but it's really a, a clear shift instead of it being such a long-term focus. We now look, I, I'm coming up to the end of my first eight week block. Um, and it's taken it, that block by block literally understanding that okay this also this is this period where I would still be competing so I'm making sure I'm doing that but making sure there's an off season as well making sure I'm, I'm having a pre-season making sure I'm periodizing properly um, but for now it's, it's very much a, a six to eight week focus as opposed to it being looking ahead to, to January or to next summer um, my step by step is, is very short term Wonderful, great. Well, thanks, Marcus. That that was the the most of the, the the sort of the journey we'd agree in terms of the conversation. So, if you're happy enough now, um, we'll jump to across to some of the questions that have come in, yep. and uh, we we'll, I'll just go through these. Some of them, I think we have addressed. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try and pick out those ones that open up some new areas. So I'll just take them in a in a chronological order in which we received them. From uh, so from Aidan Garcia Guerra, um, when did you realise you were good enough to compete the top elite level, and what advice would you give to kids who want to make it to the top like you have done? Uh, yeah, so I guess we kind of touched that a little bit. Uh, Rio 2016, when I competed, just to give you a little bit of a uh, reference. 2015 in the the qualifiers um in i think it was switzerland we had european championships and i came on fought against germany in the in the semi-finals and i messed up completely i i felt like i lost us the, the medal in that and obviously gave germany a couple more points ahead of us and after that um i sat down i was really upset but sat down with my sports psych and i was like I don't want this to happen. I don't want to be competing in the Olympics and this to happen. I was like, every day we've got to work to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And I'm ready when, when I step out in, uh, in Rio. And I was able to do that. I, I spent a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of preparation. And when I stepped out in Rio, I, I felt ready. I felt I was able to compete against these guys. And I did. I competed against these guys successfully. Um, I came on as a reserve and, and, if you look at the scores of all the different countries of the reserves that came on, they didn't do well. And the only one guy that did was, was me. And I really feel like the preparation and work that I did allowed me to perform in that moment and allowed me to think, yeah, I can do more. I can compete with these guys. Um, I am at this level. And then the advice I give to you guys is just to focus on your strengths, really understand what your strengths are and build your game around that. The beauty of fencing is that it doesn't matter if you're five foot five or six foot five, you can be a, like, at the top um, and to surround yourself with a team that shares your values and, and is on the same goal as you um, really it doesn't matter if it's your if your mum and dad that maybe don't seem to know a lot about the sport or if it's, it's someone that does surround yourself with these people because that journey it can be difficult sometimes and you want to be able to have the people around you that's really pushing you forwards and making you feel like it's an enjoyable journey more than not Okay, um, Keith Cook, um, what's the best advice you've ever been given? The best <laughs> advice I've ever been given? <laughs> Let's keep it <laughs> fencing specific. <laughs> fencing specific, okay. Uh, there's, I guess control the controllables is something I, I really think has been really beneficial for me. And that means to literally like focus on what is in your control. There's so many things which are out of your control that we get sidetracked with. And if you, 
yeah, if you can control the controllables, I generally think you're in a in a good position to win every time you're you're fighting because it allows you to to not have so much internal chatter going on, not to be uh, sidetracked or taken away from being in that present place, and it allows you just to be present and know and have some ownership over this moment in time. I am in control of what I can, and I'm going to make that work. Um, so yeah, I think control the controllables is probably probably it. Okay. Um, Daniel Sigerson here in my hometown of Belfast. Uh, which aspect of your training do you believe has the biggest impact on your competition results? I think they all, all training, all my aspects of training feed into each other. Um, I think obviously it's important to have a coach that, that like you share the same values with, you share the same idea of, of the sport. It's important to, to have that technical aspect. But, you know, if I don't have the engine, if I don't have the legs to, to work, to do those actions I'm, uh, I'm not fit enough to do it i'm never going to be able to finish out or see out a match so as good as technically i might be i need to have the fitness to do it i need to have the to do the physio work to make sure that i'm physically robust so i'm not getting injured i'm able to recover i need to do the mental preparation so that i can perform and be present in that moment i need to check in my nutrition so i feel like they all feed into to each other it's more of a system in place rather than just a one-off thing that works you know, like even the team meetings that we have, the, the support unit is around, that helps me push forward. So that gives me the motivation sometimes. That keeps me in check, maybe when I'm losing sight of what I need to. Um, it, all those things, they feed into each other. So I think they're all really important, to be honest. Okay. Betts and Paul, you, you've asked about uh, Marcus's earlier career. Hopefully we've covered that one for you. Um, Abigail uh, McVinney, uh, what are your coolest fencing experiences so far? There's been loads. There's, I, I feel really fortunate to have done the sport, to be honest. I love traveling and the sport has taken me all over the world. Um, I've been able to make friends with different team, uh, different uh, people from all over in different teams. And Japan, Japanese team took us once to go see sumo wrestling. Uh, I was in St. Petersburg and they took us to the, the ice hockey um, world championships. Like just interacting with different, different sports at World University Games was amazing um at the olympic games very surreal moments i was having a cup of tea with andy murray watching the the gb hockey team um get through their group stages was living next door to mo farah went to a saint bolt's birthday party like these are moments you sometimes look like is this happening is this really going on but the for me the the actually the sport itself is is always like the thing which i really enjoy um like one of the best things for me about about the the budapest world championships is just i was having so much fun and i got to share that with my friends with my family um you know there's not many people that their job they can share with other people and they really get excited about it um so yeah the traveling the different experiences like all those things that it comes together when you you get to do the sport at the top level and it definitely makes all the hard work and training worthwhile that leads very nicely into a question from B, who's actually on the call, I believe. Um, it's asking, a lot of young fencers are worried about making sacrifices and missing out. Um, how did you balance these decisions before you achieved success? And as you've alluded to, how do you feel looking back now? Yeah, so um, I guess it's kind of, maybe we'll touch on a little bit with uh, Bet Betson's question as well. As a, as a cadet or as a young, a young fencer, I... I guess I was picking up results quite quickly. When I was 13, I made my first top eight in a cadet tournament. Um, 15 was a top eight at Junior World Cup. 17 was Junior World Cup winner. 20 was, uh, was a European bronze medalist in the team, in the seniors. Um, all those moments required a lot of training. And there were a lot of times where I missed out on friends' birthdays, missed out on parties, missed out on situations where when you're growing up you kind of feel like oh, i want to be part of this i want to i want to be involved i i don't want to keep missing out and i think my parents were really helpful in understanding what i could and couldn't do when i was burning the candle at both ends and when i was able to actually manage my situation and i think the best thing you can do is sit down with your parents and and say this is i, I want to do well at the sport this is really something i'm working towards but I, we need to manage my season, my school calendar, my social calendar, so that I don't feel like I'm constantly making sacrifices. Um, it's part of the sport. It is, it is part of, I think, when you're trying to 
be the best at anything. There are going to be moments like that. And the older you get, it doesn't really seem like sacrifices, to be honest. It seems like, yeah, sac- it, I wouldn't say like, uh, definitely when I was younger, I would feel like I was sacrificing a friend's birthday to go to a competition or, or situations like that. I definitely felt that. But now as I look back, I don't really feel, feel it. And maybe that's just a growth. Uh, me growing up or me having a different perspective but I always try and tell the younger athletes I work with if you can sit down with your parents and kind of highlight which things are important to you which when is which competitions that you need to do to qualify which uh, training sessions how many training sessions you need to do to be better and and if each year you're saying okay we're going to keep building on this building on this building on this and you're still happy with what you're doing you're still happy with the time you're spending with your friends then it's good but you you do need to understand there are going to be times where you have to prioritize one thing over the other and it shouldn't always feel like a sacrifice it should feel like you are prioritizing the right thing um, and I know that's hard sometimes when you're young to say oh everyone's talking about this party they went over to on the weekend and I just went to a competition and it didn't go well and I don't know like I don't know why I'm doing this or what's going on like those thoughts are going to be there that's okay the same like I mentioned when I moved to New York there are times when I was thinking oh is this the right decision to make again not thinking it was a sacrifice but is this the right thing to do should I be should I be in this situation I'm missing my friend stag dues now I'm, I'm missing these moments but you end up having a group of friends that really understand why you're in these situations, why you're going for what you do and they understand and they support you. Um, and that also helps as well. So it's a, it's a learning process. You have to learn through it all. It, you will eventually see it not as a sacrifice and more as just you're changing your priorities, which is what everyone, which is what you do in life at the end of the day. So it's just adding on to that. And am I right in bringing that back to the, the, uh, what you've talked about having the team support around you the more people you have who are there's a lot of evidence to show when an, when an athlete feels they have a support structure they feel more resilient and they feel more more relaxed so uh, presumably the team that you've built around you in any moments of of doubt um, any moments of concern you have those people as you've alluded to there with parents to talk to that the more the more you have a support team around you the more likely they are to help you through that yeah for sure exactly it's really important to to speak up when you're I think one of the things I really struggled to do was ask for help when I was growing up um, throughout the world class program, throughout these situations. I just felt almost like I had to be Superman in these situations and fix all the problems, do be there for everyone, make sure I'm, I'm the strongest guy because everyone, all my friends were looking at me as this like international athlete. And a lot of people in fencing were right, looking at me and saying, Oh, is this guy going to be the next Richard or the next James Beavers or the next top guy in, in foil? Um, and so you kind of have all this weight and I never spoke about it and that was really hard and I think that's why now I, I knew that moving to New York was going to be hard that I wanted to to work with a team I wanted to be around stuff and and it can be not just in the sport so my friends for example I knew I was going to do personal training look like the best way for me to make money so when I had time I would I spoke to my friends and said if you guys want to do like personal training sessions we're not going to charge it's just an opportunity for me to catch up with you basically let's put it in let's put in a week session or once a month we do it and I was able just to still connect even though I was in New York just to have a moment where we all catch up we do a gym session I'm running the gym session for them and then afterwards we spend time talking and I'm sure you guys are having those moments now during the lockdown where you're just catching up with your friends having probably deeper conversations that you would but just keeping those people around you yeah has really really helped Okay, we have a question in from Jonathan Katz, who is one of our, our senior uh, psych guys who does a lot of work with, um, with British fencers. Um, how do you access and integrate psychology support personally in training and then transfer it to the competition environment? So I think we've, you've, you've alluded to that, you, that you, you prioritize psych within it, but maybe just a little bit of detail around that. Yeah, so the beginning... So 2013-2016 was, uh, I guess, the first real block of uh sports psychology training i went through um i had to understand that it's such an important part of the sport like everyone focuses so you can see my aesthetics it's really clear to see you can't see my brain you can't see what's going on in my head and i think that's where people don't re- they have the disconnect because then they're, they're not able to see the growth or they're not able to see um the movement coming faster or the actions going stronger they don't see that so I had to connect with that to begin with. And then I had to really have like tough conversations with myself about why 
in certain situations. You know, I had to have the uncomfortable conversations. And again, that's difficult to do because it's hard doing squats and really pushing through that final rep. But I think it's way harder to face up to yourself and say, I don't feel comfortable about this or this is difficult and I need to work through that. And I think for the first three years that I was working on that was working through, like I said, trying to approach problems in a better way, trying to work through that, trying not to put so much stress on things that I couldn't control and trying to understand when I can be there for people, when I can't, trying to work through so many different things, I guess as a person. And, and that's what the first three years was. And I feel like that really set me up well, because even though I didn't have a sports psychologist between 2017 and, and 2019 when I won the medal, um, I was working through all the stuff that we did. I was working through all of that. And my sports psychologist used to, uh, I th she always wanted to work with the person more than just as an athlete. She, she always used to think like a happy person is a happy athlete. And I really think that's true. And, and we talked a lot about what the journey would look like, what, wh how I would feel on the top of the podium more than just beyond the outcome, but seeing what that journey looked like. So I spend a lot of time working through that stuff and I still do. I read a lot. I'm always trying to read different um, models, whether it's acceptance and commitment therapy, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy. I do a lot of homework and trying to understand that the same way like I would do gym sessions. I would go to the gym and do training. I will spend time reading and trying to understand uh, what kind of stuff I can improve on. And those are recommended to me generally by sport, the sports psychologists I'm working with or the sports psychologists that I used to work with, um, those kind of books. And then the things which resonate me, the things which I understand or I don't understand, that's kind of where the conversation goes. And now the work that I've been doing from 2000, uh, from the, the end of 2019 and currently is still working on that, me as a person, but there's also now building in the performance side of it even more, like really pushing through the way I make my strengths play, with well, the way I play to my strengths, the way I make my super strengths even better, the way I understand when I'm overplaying my strengths, those kind of things. Um, so it's like repeatable exercises I do in training, a lot of research and reading, and a lot of conversations. I think those are the main three probably that I do. Okay, and connected into that, given our current situation, Sam Parfit, who is a talent athlete project, who are a partner with British Fencing, has asked a question around how you are coping in the mental health with strategy um, at the moment in lockdown and, and any tips for any of our younger, younger athletes? I think it's important to, uh, to check in with yourself, to see how you're feeling, validate how you're feeling as well. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, you know, that people say it's okay not to be okay. Like those kind of things are, yeah, it's, it's true. That you need to sometimes sit with yourself and say, yeah, you know what, I'm not feeling good or this is not good. This moment in time is very difficult. Um, and then have a conversation about it with people that you feel comfortable having that conversation, whether it's your parent, whether it's your friend, whether you need to write it down to begin with just so you can, you can see it on paper. Sometimes that really helps for me as well. Um, but checking in with yourself, I think is important. Keeping up communication. And then obviously I'm, I'm a sportsman, so I, I think exercise does a whole lot of good, but I really do feel like just doing some kind of exercise, whether it is just a little home, home workout routine you can do in, a, in your kitchen or if you have a garden, doing more stuff like that. But just keeping that exercise going really helps you, I think, mentally keep in check. Um, and yeah, like that, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, ben Andrews um, has asked, uh, what does your recovery look like after training and competitions, especially when you have to compete on back-to-back -back days? Yeah, so I think we target hydration. Um, I'm, a, I'm a heavy sweater, so I lose, I lose a lot of, I guess, fluids when I'm competing, so I need to replace that. Eating, I need to repl uh, restore all the... the the, the carbs I guess that I've been burning the glycogen that I've been burning so re make sure I'm building up those stores stretching making sure that I'm recovering I put my body through a lot you always your body moves in maybe different ways that you weren't really planning for it to so you just need to address that um, and then rest as well and it, I think it's really important to understand that your mind is still active when you're on social media or when you're texting or whatever it's, it's having those moments to actually completely switch off other than when you're sleeping. You know, sleeping is important. You need to get that rest and recovery. But if you have a moment when you're getting physio treatment or if you have a moment where you can just like sit and not, not be on your phone, that actually makes a big difference. Um, 
So like in competitions, I always try and just switch my, put my phone on airplane mode. I listen to my music, but yeah, I'm not distracting myself with the social media or with, with uh, like texting people. It's actually just allowing me to be present in that moment, allowing me to still just recharge and refresh when I need to. Um, so yeah, hydration, eating, stretching and rest and understanding what all those mean for you is, is really important. And that's my routine. And I think what you do well is you afford yourself with Dan and the rest of us an opportunity then to uh, to step back from day one and then prepare properly for day two. Video analysis, once you know the draw, you know, there's, and once you know the time you're on, you then make those micro adjustments around that. Yeah, exactly. And then also being able to switch off and, and in those moments, like not talk shop anymore. We've done the video analysis. We've done all the preparation for it. Let's have dinner. Let's have a conversation. We can talk about football. We can talk about what's going on. We can talk about anything other than fencing, but we just have a conversation um, that doesn't involve talking shop and it allows you just to switch off completely. So when you're ready for it, because it's always going to come in, there's always, you've done the video analysis and you're thinking about this fencer and maybe you're thinking about, oh, I beat that guy last time, 5-0, I can do really well in this match. Or you're thinking, oh, I didn't beat him. I've got to do better this time. Those all things can come into your head, but if you just allow yourself to switch off and then say, okay, we're going to have a different conversation. We're going to eat and talk about the food or talk about football, talk about school, talk about anything, anything else just allows you to really switch off and say, okay, I'm in this moment now. When I come tomorrow, we're in that moment and we're ready to go. And that goes for the support staff, as in coach uh, and everyone else around you as well. I think it's important that they understand you need to switch off. So it allows them the opportunity to switch off as well. Yeah, exactly. Like I'll be getting treatment and I'll be talking about travel stories with my with the physio. Different times I've been backpacking, different things that I've done, different things that she's done, the holidays that she wants to go on to, different sites, like all those kind of things. It just allows you just to step away and say like, OK, I know I'm at a competition here. But I've given myself like 10, 15 minutes just to really just detach and be just, yeah, just refresh, recharge. And then when you come back in, you're able to go. Because it's very, it's very difficult, especially when you're competing throughout the whole day. If you're switched on the whole day, it's quite hard really to be competing at that, that level all the way throughout. You have to come on, switch off, switch back on, switch off. And when you're able to do that really well, I feel like you're able to manage your energy source a lot better as well. Okay, we've a few minutes left. Let's try and rattle through these. Joe Walmsley, if you were defence the world's final again, what tactical changes would you make? Uh, I think so. T Maybe tactically, we don't give it all away in case you fence, you fence Enzo the next time. Don't tell him everything. <laughs> yeah, no, that it is too. The, the the tactical change I would make would be to just to to push more, to use the piece more. I felt like I was cutting everything off very quickly. Um, so when I was pushing to attack, I was stopping too early. When I was defending, I was stopping too early. Um, and then the, the second is more mentally, just to keep like really, I, I don't think that I went into there um, like content that I made my medal. You know, I told you before, like I really wanted to make sure I was fighting for a, a silver and a gold as opposed to a third and a nothing. But um, I definitely wasn't as present as I wanted to be. That was definitely in a world championships final. I was, that was my first one, I know, but I wasn't as present as I, I would have liked to have been. And I think the, the same moment I had in, in the Euros in 2015, where I lost to, where I felt like I lost the match to Germany and I came away and I was like, okay, we've got a year, year to go. I'm not going to let that happen again. I've been working through the same mental preparation, the sec well, not the same, but through mental preparation, through mental strategies, so when I have that moment in, in Tokyo, it, I'm, I'm, I feel I'll be better prepared. Um, so it's tactical and, and mental, I guess. And that's why I said it all comes, it all plays in together. It all feeds into each other. Okay. Um, Claire Kelly, uh, what's a good breakfast to have before a competition? Um, depends on what you can stomach, really, I guess. But uh, it's, important, it's important to have a lot of carbs, like slow-releasing carbs is good. I like to have oatmeal. Um, so for me, my, my breakfast would be oatmeal with bananas. Um, you've got like slow releasing carbs with the oatmeal. A little bit of sugar, but still pretty slow releasing with the bananas. But um, then I'd have two pieces of toast with eggs and honey. Might not sound that nice, but it works for me. <laughs> and uh, again, the honey's a, bit, a little bit faster releasing, but everything I'm thinking about is setting me up for maybe three or four hours later for when I'm gonna eat again. Um, but that, and then obviously I'm hydrating a lot as well. 
So I'm making sure that I have uh, my electrolytes in the morning. Um, but yeah, any slow releasing carbs are going to be really beneficial. And if you don't, if you don't like eating oatmeal, if that's not your thing, maybe work on like bread, but brown bread um, is going to be useful. Have, you can have banana sandwiches. Again, might not sound that nice, but actually it's pretty nice. Like have a bit of honey on it. Just focus on what slow releasing carbs, anything with a low GI um, is going to give you two or three hours of energy that you can push through. Okay, um, I've seen you eat. You enjoy your food, so that is good to know. That yep. <laughs> I understand. I understand that from first-hand experience. A um, couple more, Vanessa Blackledge. Uh, what was? Uh, who was your childhood inspiration? Have to be quick on this one to let you away. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's there's quite a few, but actually, I would say my mind immediately always goes to Kelly Holmes. Um, my first Olympic memory where I was like, I want that, I want that moment, was her 2004 double gold. And I can see her face so clearly crossing the line. Um, it was really cool. And then we had the UK school games and she gave me my medal when I came second and I, I messed up my final. I really wanted to win, was putting too much pressure on myself to win. I had a massive deficit and I clawed it all the way back and lost 15-14. Um, and she gave me my medal and she was like, I know you wanted to win, but you did yourself really proud today. You should be really proud of, of, put, of not giving up or keep fighting. She was like, you just got to keep doing that the whole way through. And I read, she, she released a book and I read her story and there's a lot of similarities. But for me, she is, yeah, she's definitely someone I look up to. And, and yeah, if, if I can get one of those gold medals, I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> Okay, Louis, you know, uh, Louis, you asked about uh, the right time moving to Brooklyn, so hopefully we've covered that one. Um, excuse me if I pronounce the name wrong, Rudy Bruin Yard. Um, how did you manage to study, uh, how do you manage your studies alongside your fencing ambitions? Yeah, so I, it was really difficult, like, to balance that, to be honest. Um, I was fortunate that at my university, London School of Economics, we were able to spread the university time out. So I did it over six years, as opposed to standard three years um it was support from my parents again uh them knowing when to I guess push me into sport a little like the fencing a little bit more and when to push me into my academics my mum was always pretty strict on making sure that i that i studied that i got my work done when i was younger it was do your homework and then you can go fencing uh if you don't do your homework no fencing so i was always trying to get that done and the same if i wanted to go see my friends it was get your homework done then you can go see them so my parents played a part in, you know, when you're young, you don't want to do your homework. It's just not something you want to do. So it helped, like, I guess forcing me to do it, to prioritize that, make sure that I was done, but also allowing me to see if I get this done, I can, I can do something I enjoy. I can go see my friends. I can go and, and, and go fencing and training later. Um, and that kind of mindset was that I was able to keep working through and keep pushing through but it's definitely a balance I, I think again speak to people when I was at university I was speaking to my academic advisor um, I spoke to some other athletes as well and we ended up setting up a, a scholarship program at LSE to help athletes because so many were just struggling and if we hadn't had those conversations we wouldn't have known what people needed um, whether it was financial support, uh, more meeting times with academic advisors, being able to log on to sessions when you're abroad. We were able to put all those things through. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to say, okay, I need help in this moment. Um, and how are we going to be able to make that happen? Um, I think if you come at it with, a, with, with collaboration, understanding that you want to work together on something with people, then people are more likely to be involved and want to do that. Um, if you just come up with excuses and say, oh, I can't do this, I need an extension on my paper and not really tell them why, then they're less likely to be on board. So communication definitely helps with that and time management is really important too. Okay, and final question, Keith Cook again. Um, Cookie's asking, what habits and routines have you adopted to make you better each year? Um, so that whole idea of the growth mindset, I think is really important. It's, it's asking questions, asking a lot of questions, um, but making sure they're coming from a place of curiosity, not challenging, not, uh, trying to put people down or, or prove that I'm right, but actually just keep asking questions, keep learning. Those are the things The I do, I guess like headspace meditation. That's something I do daily, which I think has been really, really beneficial, like working through that. Um, even small things. So once I moved on from just taking 10 minutes of my day to do it, 
I do stuff like just eating my cereal when I'm having my cereal. Uh, I don't have my phone with me. Try not to listen to to music or the news. I actually just be present in that moment. It's it allows me just to have a different example when I want to be present on the piece. It's just enjoying eating the cereal, having my coffee in the morning, tasting the coffee, listening to the sounds around me, um, and just being present in that moment. Uh, I think the other thing as well is I guess maybe these these are all mindset stuff, but like understanding I can do more keep on pushing myself so understanding as well like that doesn't mean going a hundred percent from day one but it's building into something gradually moving into it but just keep working through that keep trying to push myself keep trying to every day ask myself am I doing enough you know have, having that question with myself I guess questions just a lot of questions I keep asking myself um, to make myself better and as long as I'm asking the questions writing it down addressing them properly I'm able to communicate with myself and the others around me. Okay, this is how we we beat 2019 version of Marcus. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, an hour and a half has flown by. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. That was really insightful. Thank you for your. Op uh, I know you as a very open and uh, approachable person, and it's been great that you you've been prepared to share that with everyone. Um, we look forward to celebrating in Tokyo. Hopefully, yeah, sooner definitely. rather than later. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks to everybody who has given us Christ. Thank you to everyone who's uh, sat in today. Thanks to Rob Caudron for helping pull this together. And um, hopefully that gives everyone some food for thought moving forward. Um, I, would, I would endorse Marcus as a, a very rounded and a very positive human being and athlete, uh, a pleasure to work with. Um, very challenging at times in absolutely the right way, um, but very much a team player. So a lot of what Marcus has uh, exhibited today and alluded to today is exactly what we're trying to build through uh, British fencing. So if you if you are keen to in any way chat to us about this, follow us. I'm always open to, to discussion. So uh, please come back to us and let us know. But thanks everyone. Stay safe, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. I hope you guys enjoyed. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.